work it, make it, do it, make sense. Thank you for joining me uh, for the next uh, 50 minutes. You will not have 50 minutes of me talking. Uh, I have more than 50 minutes worth of stories, but I'm not going to bore you with them. Uh, I'm going to get you to do some work uh, as we go through this as well. So if you, if you want to just sit there and relax, you've probably come to the wrong session. Uh, I'm going to make you think and do stuff, which can be annoying, but you might enjoy it. Give it a try. You might enjoy it. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is nothing to do with technology which might be a bit strange for a conference called DevOps, but I'm a firm believer in that uh, a fool with a tool um, is still a fool. So uh, instead of talking about giving uh, fools technology, what I'm going to talk to you about is how you can make fools and, uh, and make them into the incredibly smart people. Um, a little bit of background about me. I spent the last four years working with Atlassian in Sydney. Um, I joined Atlassian when we were about 400 people. Uh, two locations, sort of 35,000 customers. Uh, the world was incredibly simple. Everything just worked. Uh, we were nimble because we were small. Um, it was just a really easy and fun place to work. And my boss, the VP of engineering at the time, sat me down and said, Dom, I never, never ever want to get on stage and be famous for saying how big we are. I never want to stand on stage and say we're 15,000 people or 20,000 people because that's not a measure that I'm proud of. Uh, I want us to, to be a, a relevant place to work, an awesome place to work, fun and nimble and agile and, and a place where people aspire to be like, where, where there's a culture that you want to mimic uh, and copy. Uh, so can you go and do your thing and, and work that out? And what I discovered when I did a whole lot of research was there were some good practices out there, there were some good uh, techniques, but there was nothing that we could sort of grab and, and that was going to help us scale. We wanted to grow and stay awesome, we didn't want to get big. Uh, and so we decided to invent our own way of doing it. And that's some of the story I'm going to share with you today. Atlassian today, for those that don't know, is a 2,000 person organization, 85,000 customers. Uh, we're in eight locations around the world, uh, and our growth has continued consistently over those four years and continues into the future. So we're continually evolving the way we work, and that scaling is some of what I want to talk through today. The very first thing I'm going to make you do is make you very uncomfortable. I'm going to make you speak to the person next to you. Uh, it's not like a therapy session. Uh, if there's no one next to you, you just have to kind of edge along until you find someone. So other people over there are going to have the most fun. You've got to move like three whole seats. Um, I'm assuming you're all here because you're already highly intelligent. Pe people that tend to come to conferences on a Friday when they could be in the slug and lettuce having a beer tend to be those that have a desire to grow and develop and learn something new. The thing is, I've, one of the things I've realized in my career is I learn nothing from myself. That doesn't stop me occasionally believing my own bullshit, but it's not healthy. So I want to start this session with you finding someone in the room, preferably someone next to you, and just take 40 seconds, 20 for the first person, 20 for you, and just share what's the hardest challenge for you in being a leader. And I'm making the assumption there that everyone in this room is leading something, whether they're leading people directly, or a team, or a project, or a product, you are leading something. So find someone in the room, 40 seconds, what's the hardest thing about being a leader? Go. Okay, let's call that time. You, you always know when you've got a good developer community when the majority of people go to their phones or laptops for the answers. It's, it's like, who wants to be a millionaire? Can I phone a friend? I'm sure the answer's online somewhere. Let me just, let me just Google it. Um, who wants to share? 
Anyone, shout out, put your hand up and I will point at you and you get to shout very loudly. Come on, Sharon, you're coming. Yes, sir. Uh, getting people to do what I want them to do when they're constantly standing over their shoulders. Ah, getting people to do what you want them to do. Have you tried telling them? That never works, by the way. We'll cover that later. I've told you a million times and I'm telling you for the millionth and one, why you? Yeah, okay. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. Communicate with each other, yeah, like two different teams, God forbid. Like when you get like the marketing people and the legal people. It always amuses me that even when you're in the same organization, you have the ability to compete with your peers better than you ever compete with your competitors outside. I often think like if a competitor could have like a CCTV camera in your office, they just relax. They're like, you're so screwed internally. I don't need to beat you. Like you're beating yourself. This is fine. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. Ah, honesty and speaking their mind. Yeah, one of the things that we'll cover in this is the idea of respectful dissent. Um, I actually did a talk a few weeks ago at uh, Australia's largest bank, and I was talking about respectful dissent, and the boss was in the front row, and he was petrified. He's like, no, 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 that, that's not going to work here. And I was like, no, respectful dissent is good because you hear from your people what they do and don't like, and, and, and that enables you to be a better leader. Uh, there were some hands up at the back. Anyone? Yes, sir. Ah, remote and distributed teams, yeah, we'll cover that. So uh, it's one of the reasons we actually built what I'm going to share with you today is we are spread geographically, culturally, and across time zones, and that psychological and physical distance does make a difference. I'm all for remote and distributed teams. I think it's a great idea, but you have to know how to manage in that environment. Um, anyone who's not a white male? Ah, yes, there we go. <laughs> I was scouring the room. I was going to find you somewhere, yes. Yes, getting the business on board. Yeah, yeah so, so I'm, I'm guessing from that you're in a kind of uh, a technology-related team that is running in an agile fashion as part of a business that is not running in an agile fashion. So you get that friction of different ways of working. Anyone else experience that every day? Yeah, okay, you're in the right room. Good. So um, the reason uh, I want to talk about this today is, is I was actually at a talk a few years ago with uh, Gary Hamill. He's a uh, a lecturer at the London School of Economics, best-selling author, uh, who talks a lot about what slows teams down. Oh, by the way, all this information is publicly available to you. Don't be scared to take any pictures. Um, and I'm at Don Price on Twitter. If you want to contact me or tweet any of this, go for your life. None of this is a secret. Uh, so bureaucracy is the kryptonite. Bureaucracy is this thing that kind of, it's this baggage that we hold. It's the fact that we don't feel comfortable to speak up. The fact that people won't do what we've asked them to do. Uh, the fact that we've got people working in different ways, it's just adding friction to the way we work without adding any value. Some friction's really valuable. I like putting designers, product managers, and, and engineers at a whiteboard with pens and watching them ferociously argue because that's a really healthy level of friction. That's the one bringing their best self, bringing their views to the table and having a rich conversation. Way too often that gets uh, put down. Uh, this guy, Neil Armstrong. Uh, a wonderful chap for those that don't know him, uh, and this guy, Steve Jobs, who's way more sort of uh, known in the tech space. So the reason I've got the, these two people on screen is, for some reason in society and as a community, we have this habit of celebrating the individual. Yeah, we talk about landing on the moon, and we talk about Neil Armstrong. But Neil Armstrong didn't land on the moon, NASA did. And when we talk about great tech, a lot of people talk about Steve Jobs instead of talking about Apple. But when you think about some of the achievements that Apple have actually accomplished, they were achieved by a team. There was a team of people there that enabled that. And I have a bit of a problem with this because when we celebrate the individual, we end up putting that individual on a pedestal. And by doing that, we're actually downplaying all the effort involved. Like for you with your technology, that technology doesn't exist without the business. The people that speak up, if they don't speak up, the business doesn't exist anymore. And so we need to understand how we celebrate teams I actually looked at a recent Ernst & Young survey that said that 90% of organizations are solving problems so complex, they have to have teams solve them. The reason they want teams is they want that cognitive diversity, diversity of mindset and skill set and experience. Cognitive diversity in my world is way more valuable than any other form of diversity. Uh, we're actually, we've got a panel discussion later on this afternoon on diversity, and for me, the mental diversity Surrounding myself with people that think differently to me is the most powerful form of diversity. Now, let me talk about some of the challenges I've had as a leader, which is why I'm actually talking about this topic today. Uh, I, I'm going to guess that at least uh, three of these will, will resonate with you. So the first one is scaling. 
As I mentioned before, I joined at last year when it was 400 people, and we're now 2,000. We we're 30 something thousand customers, now we're 85,000. We're a few products, and now we're many. My boss sat me down in my first week and said, Dom, to keep your job, you need to grow by 40% year on year, just to keep your job. If you want to excel at your job, you need to grow by more than 40%. Now, he was being a bit of a, an idiot, right? I didn't actually have to grow by 40%, but he was setting an expectation with me that the world around me was changing. If I think about the environment that you're probably in, the technology refresh cycle is moving at a, a pace it's never moved at before. Your customers have more information than they've ever had in their entire lives. In fact, in some industries, the customers have more information than you do. I was talking to a guy the other week who runs restaurants. He said, back in the day, people used to walk past my restaurant, they'd see the ambiance, the vibe, the music, the candles, they'd smell the food, they'd see the patrons, they'd walk in, sit down, and spend $100, $150. He said, now people walk past the restaurant, they smell the ambience, the vibe, and they get the phone out and they start Googling. I wonder, I wonder what this restaurant's like. They've stopped trusting their instinct of, this looks like a really nice place to eat, and they will search the internet till they find a negative review, and they'll go next door, and then they'll go next door. Customers have more information than they've ever had before. They've also got epically low switching costs in most industries. Certainly, you know, with the Atlassian product suite, we've built those in a way at a low price point, but what that means is a lot of our competitors are at a similarly low price point, so if you don't like the service we provide, turn it off and you go somewhere else. In a lot of industries, people think they have customer loyalty when actually all they have is customer apathy. Customers can't be asked moving, but eventually they will, right? They will find a better product or service and move on. And once you've lost them, it's a lot more expensive to get them back. You've then got this idea of customers, those, sorry, not customers, competitors, those wonderful people that there's the ones you know about that you can go and analyze, and then there's the ones you don't know about that are secretly sort of hiving away somewhere in a garage in a room, and their desire is to beat you and knock you off your perch. Um, they're a lot harder to tackle. When I think about those, I think about relevance. I think about co companies like Borders. Borders bookstores in the US, for anyone that doesn't know, is like rated as the best bookstore in the world. They nailed the whole premise of bookstores. You went in, you looked at books, you bought a book, you maybe had a coffee, and then you left. And they absolutely optimized that world. It was awesome. Until the Kindle and iPad came along. And then they were highly irrelevant. They'd optimized the world for a customer that no longer existed. And then the last one is people. In the war for talent, you know, scaling is really important because I want to hire the smartest people everywhere, but so does everyone else. No one, I don't see any company you know, advertising, we'll hire the B or C players that no one else will hire. We'll hire the average mediocre people. So we're in this war for talent. Who in the room is time poor? Oh, everyone else has got lots of time on their hands. This is awesome. Uh, time is an interesting one. So time in my world is something that gets discussed and debated a lot, but it's actually irrelevant. The thing that we're really meaning to talk about, that we're not honest about, is prioritization. So when I say to one, I haven't got the time, what I really mean is, you're not my priority right now. But I don't have that honest conversation. I use buzzwords like time poor uh, and hope that they will either go away or just you know, come back another time. But they come back another time, and I'm still time poor, when really what I should have just said was, I'm not going to do the thing you want me to do. It's a favor or whatever else, because you're not my priority. These three things are more important than you, or more important than the thing you're asking me to do. We tend not to have those conversations. As a leader, I'm expected to be a multiplier, and I'm sure anyone who's gone from being an individual contributor to being a people manager or leader has felt this pain at some point, when there's not enough hours in the day. Because you're trying to do your work and a little bit of everyone else's work, and it's really hard. What you have to do is become a multiplier. You have to be able to invest the eight hours you have a day to impact many more people than yourself. And the last one, this is particularly something I found with a lot of our development community in Atlassian and, and around the world, and also with our designers. This idea of perfection. I've got to get it finished before I ship it. It's a killer to our productivity. It's a killer to our mojo and our teamwork. One of the things we've moved to at Atlassian now is that progress is a shitload more important than perfection. And people go, yeah, yeah no, I, I get that. I've just got to get that pixel right, and I've got to get this. No, no, no. Progress is more important than perfection. Momentum is more important than nailing that end goal, because you'll actually get there quicker by measuring progress than you will by being a perfectionist. The reason this is more important for me right now is the technology refresh cycle we're going through is bringing things along like artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, robotics. 
There's been a huge change in the workforce and the nature of work in the last few years. I think the change we're about to go through, the one that we're going to experience as a generation, is a, a shitload more scary than the one that previous generations have gone through. It's scary because of the impact it's going to have on us as a society, scary because of the impact on roles and, and jobs, and scary because of the pace of change and the nature of that change. Uh, when I think about AI, we did a recent survey. 80% uh, of the people we surveyed said they were petrified, worried that AI would uh, increase unemployment. If you look at other research, in the last 144 years, congratulations to all of you in the room, you've enabled more jobs to be created than were actually taken away. So technology is a net addition to the economy and to the workforce. The problem is, and this is something that we all need to be aware of, is that it causes a mass displacement of roles. So if you go back 30, 40 years, agriculture was a huge employer, and now software is a huge employer. Now, that's cool for all of us in the room, because it means we get good jobs, we get to come to conferences like this. The problem is, is that the entire system, the community we're part of, the education system and the learning system, is not geared up to understand this change. We need to understand how this change is occurring. So good news. 90% uh, of, of companies need teams. Teams are awesome. We're all awesome. The world's changing. We're all smart. The problem is we're a little bit screwed because when we interviewed people, 78% of people said they didn't trust their teammates. And I've got a bit of a problem with this because I don't, I don't really care which religion you sign up for. We've all been on this, this earth for a while. Let's just agree it's a good while. And by this stage, we should have kind of got these things nailed. These are things that as humans we should be good at because they're kind of uniquely human skills. And yet for some reason, we've unlearned these skills and we're trying to compete with the machines and the robots which are better at being machines and robots. So the two things that people cited as being reasons they don't trust teammates, communication, which we had in here, and accountability. I think, sir, to your first point, right? I've asked you or I believe you're doing something and it looks like you're not doing it. I'm trying to hold you to account. It's a painful part of working in a team. When these things really start to hurt you, it's when you get that sensation of going, it's going to be easier if I just do it myself. Except then you can't be a multiplier. You can't actually have the impact you want. So I decided to do a tiny bit of research. And when I say tiny, I mean back of a napkin type research. And I came to the conclusion that the, uh, we, we have to find blame. Right? It's, very, it's very important that we find someone to blame. And I'm blaming the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution left us with this legacy. The Industrial Revolution was a time where the workforce was white male, the workforce was illiterate, and the workforce used their hands, and they didn't need to use their heads. In fact, you definitely didn't want them to think. You just wanted the workforce to do. And so a system was created. The manager was invented. The manager who pushes bits of paper and tasks around that makes sure everyone does the things they need to do. The manager that has maybe has a carrot, but definitely has a stick. And the manager's role is to sharpen that stick and beat you down until you do all the tasks you're supposed to do. In that world, your, your team, your business, your organization, your leadership style was efficient. It was all about being efficient. How can I standardize the way we work? How can I eliminate variability? How can I get the most number of outputs possible today? And how can I get one more output tomorrow? Because that's demonstrated improvement. How can I centralize all decision-making? Because I don't trust any of these people I've employed who are illiterate. I don't trust them. So how do I bring all decisions to me? How do I keep my job secure by building a large monolithic team that is highly dependent on me as a leader? How do I build a hierarchy? Because power is the thing that wields control. Power is the currency in that organization. For those who feel the need to be honest in the room, put your hand up if any of those things match to any of your leadership style, to teams that you're in or teams that you work with, where you feel like you may have accidentally optimized for efficiency. Oh, we've got some honest people in the room. Cool. Now, that's not, un that's not unnatural. That's a normal thing to do. The advantage with efficiency is you can see it. It's kind of scientific, and it's great instant gratification. If, I've, if I'm running a factory and I get one more output today than I got yesterday, I see that today. In our world, in a world where curiosity, creativity, invention, innovation is key, where you want to be effective, that's a lot harder to measure because you're trying to measure impact in that world. What you're trying to say is, I want to delight my customers and have them use my products and be an advocate for me. That's a lag indicator that occurs after the event and it feels a bit soft. 
So the scientific part of our brain goes, no, no, let's not measure that. Let's measure the fact, did we ship on Friday? Yes, we shipped. Yay! What did we ship? It doesn't matter. We shipped on Friday. So let's have a beer or a pale ale or a craft beer or a, whatever it is you choose to drink and celebrate the fact that we shipped. But that's an output. Shipping is an output. There's no quality, there's no measurable impact in that. You want to measure the outcome. So with our teams, we've been dragging them over to the effectiveness. If people don't like the word effectiveness, the other word I use is relevance. So if you look at the Fortune 500 in the year 2000, 50% of the organizations, half the organizations that were on the Fortune 500 in the year 2000 are no longer there. They were very successful, very profitable, large organizations. They are no longer there. They were efficient, they'd optimized, they'd become very insular, and all they cared about was their business and not the job to be done or the impact they were trying to have, and they are no longer in the Fortune 500. So we're dragging our teams bit by bit over to be more effective. In a more effective organization, your communication doesn't go up the chain of command to go across to go down, it just goes across. For anyone who's ever done, like, it's Friday, so I'm sure some of you have to do some form of status reporting, right? I was talking to some project managers the other week, like, yeah, so I did my status report, which gets aggregated into the group, aggregated into the program, which goes up to our boss and our boss's boss, upper management and the leader, it then goes across and it goes down. The problem was each person polishes that information. I'm not going to call it data, because it's not anymore. It, it, they polish it because they want to present a certain view. By the time it gets to the person that needs it, it's about two weeks old, and it bears no resemblance to the actual truth. And yet someone is then going to try and make a decision off that information. And when you think about it, you'd never accept that in any other form of life. But in businesses, these politics, these efficient ways of working, of wanting to look good, actually get in the way. In our world, what we're trying to do is give our teams the freedom to create their own rhythm and cadence. They know their environment better than me. So this is not a top-down approach, it's a bottoms-up approach. And the way we do this is by empowering and giving our teams autonomy to work the way they want to work to get the things done that they need to get done. So all really easy, dead simple, job done, absolute pain in the ass. So we tried it and it was really, pardon my French, really fucking hard. Because um, it, it, it was just too soft and fluffy. It also lacks self-awareness. So what we did was we created all these funky, nice ways of working, and we packaged them up, and I went around the Atlassian organization, I went to the first team, and I'm like, here's some brilliant ways of working. And they're like, ah, oh, thanks, we're awesome. Um, we don't need it. The team over there that we've been working with, shit. So I went to them, and they're like, oh, no, we've been together for years. We've been working together for like 10 years now. We're like, we're really tight. So don't talk to us, talk to the other team. And by about the 100th team, I realized that I was flogging a dead horse. What was lacking was self-awareness, the understanding of what is the impact of me not working in an effective manner. So one of the things we went out and built was this awareness that tools alone weren't the answer. Now, for a technology company, this was quite a kind of mic drop moment. You know, Atlassian's been on, on, this, uh, on the earth for like 15 years, and we've just been going products and tools and agile, products and tools and agile, and then we're like, we've kind of had this realization that tools alone aren't the answer. Like, if you've just got really good tools but bad people and bad practices, the things you're delivering aren't going to be great. So how do we get this mix right of having smart people like you, of having the right tools that you select and download and use every day and configure, but also the right practices? And if we don't evolve those practices, we're not going to get the value we need. So to create some self-awareness, I looked at a whole of uh, historical Atlassian projects. I looked at the good ones, uh, the ones where we have Atlassian t-shirts printed and we've got parties and blogs and stories. And we're like, oh yeah, I remember shipping Jira 6 and that party, we went bowling, we all got drunk. I took those and I looked for what elements did they have that I believe made them successful. And then I went into the Atlassian closet for all the skeletons, the projects that don't get spoken about, the ones where, and you have them in your organization as well, when you say the project name, people get like cold sweats and start retreating. I went and looked at all those projects as well, because I wanted to know what attributes they were missing that made them a, a failure, made them not a success. And we landed on these eight attributes. Now, if I worked at Stanford or Harvard or somewhere fancy, I'd go and do a mass amount of research and prove this, but I genuinely couldn't be asked. And so what I did was I bribed a team, I found the Bitbucket team, and I said, I will buy you coffee, I'll buy everyone in the team a coffee, if you give me one hour to try this thing, because I think it might work, and if it doesn't, you've had a free coffee, and if it does, 
shit, maybe one day I'll be in DevOx in London on the stage telling people about it. Um, and so we ran the session, and it worked. The, the, the team really enjoyed it. And the team lead said, I'm actually team lead on a couple of other teams. We run it on those, we run it on those, someone else heard about it. Within two weeks, I'd run over 30 sessions. We never mandated, we never rolled out, there's not a program name, there's, there's nothing that makes this a thing other than teams saying, we're curious about how we can work better and we're willing to invest one hour. What happened after that was uh, the fear of missing out kicked in. So I started to get calls from all over the Atlassian world, from San Francisco and Austin and Poland and Amsterdam saying, we've been hearing about this team thing that you've been doing, why, why aren't we getting it? It's not fair. Everyone wants it, and then marketing and HR and legal, everyone got involved. I've now had the luxury and, and fortune of running over 600 sessions with teams across Atlassian and over 150 sessions with Atlassian customers, with people outside the Atlassian world. At first, we thought every team was a project team, uh, project, product, whatever you want to call it. These teams have a start, middle, and an end. The end is often the shipping of a product, a feature, a service. Sometimes those teams stay together, other times those teams di disband. One of the commonalities with a project team is it's cross-functional. It's not necessarily the people that you report to or report to you. It's often many people from different functions contributing. And that's where it gets really murky, because they have different bosses and often have different goals, and they will be dragged in different directions. And the project has its own goals, and you get that friction. It's not always a positive friction. So we thought that was the only team, and then I tried running them with a few teams, and it didn't work. So we landed on two more team types, team personas. Uh, leadership teams. Leadership teams are teams that are setting vision, direction. They are inspiring the people around them. Ideally, they are coaching and mentoring. The reason we landed on the, uh, the leadership team was what we found was a lot of our leaders, and uh, I'm sure some of you will, will maybe admit to this, a lot of our leaders were getting dragged down into the project that they were supposed to be leading. So is anyone familiar with the phrase pigeon boss? No? Okay, good. I'll tell you about pigeon bosses because we found quite a few of them in Atlassian. The pigeon boss is the boss that wants to be a leader and gets really busy doing stuff and then suddenly one day panics that they don't know everything about the project that you're working on. So they fly in, they shit everywhere, and then fly straight out. And all they do is completely distract you from the thing you are doing by asking stupid questions that are irrelevant to you. So it's not like sparring where someone says, ah, oh, I see you've made that screen, uh, Jason, I see you've made that screen blue, and yet, you know, we're talking about, yeah, I think, you know, our color palette's more green, and it's not that. They, go, they come in and they go, why is it blue? And then they walk out, and you're like, why, why is it blue? Should it be blue? And, and all you're left with is curiosity of a very bad form, right? It's just uncertainty. So what we did with our leaders was say, actually, we need to redefine your role as a leader. Your role as a leader is to inspire and coach and mentor, to set that vision and direction. You need to be thinking over a longer-term time horizon, because if you're not setting that 12, 18-month North Star and vision and roadmap, we're never going to know whether we're making progress, because we don't even know where we're supposed to be going. So what we found was our project teams were getting very insular and very short time frame, because they didn't have the vision, and then they were shipping stuff and going, do you like that? And people were going, no, but it's too late. We weren't experimenting, we just didn't know where we were going. So we set the tone with our leaders that they had to lead. What we then found was a lot of people, and I'm sure you, you may all feel this, you're actually a member of more than one team. So a lot of our leaders were enjoying this because they were like, ah, now I'm in this leadership team meeting or forum or committee or whatever, I need to think and act like a leader. But also as a leader, they were on project teams. And so this actually helped them with their context switching to say, what is your role in this group with this team? The last one we landed on was service team. Uh, originally, I actually thought this was going to be restricted to customer support teams and IT help desk. What we found in Atlassian, uh, partially due to technology change, uh, partially our move to the cloud, our move to kind of a, a platform and product type architecture and mindset, is there are a lot more service teams in my business today than there were 18 months, two years ago. Service teams subtly differ to project teams. They don't have a ship date, and they don't have full control over their backlog. They provide a service, either internally or externally, and they are reliant on people raising tickets or raising something in some form that forms a queue, and their role is to clear that queue. Interestingly, that's not their only role. Uh, what we found with a lot of service teams is they thought 
their only role was to clear the queue. Those service teams look and feel a smell a lot like firefighters. They see a fire, they fly in, they put the fire out, they get the high five, the bottle of wine, the thank you, and then they wait for the next fire and they fly and they put that fire out. They're actually dragging your business down every single day. They're dragging your teams down, your productivity and your performance because you are never improving. You're only ever managing the status quo. So what we said to our service teams was, how do you understand firefighting? Because you will have to do some of it with fireproofing, which is how do we detect and prevent things from going wrong in the future? How do we understand the themes of some of the services we're providing and provide self-service to our customers so that not everything comes to us? So we've had a lot of fun with these. We, we launched the three health monitors um, to accompany them. We actually launched 26 plays internally in Atlassian. The plays, imagine the health monitor as an exercise that your fitness instructor puts you through, puts you through a whole lot of drills. And then what we had to create was, yeah, when you do a health monitor, you feel a bit, feel a bit crap at the end of it, because you're like, we've just realized we're not great. And that can be a little bit upsetting. So what we did was we started to document plays. And the plays are the exercises our teams do to get better at the areas where they're struggling. Um, we've been running with this for about a year and a half, nearly two years in Atlassian, uh, across the globe, 300 plus teams, going really well. And I sat down with Mike and Scott, our co-founders, in the middle of last year, and we decided that given that our mission is to unleash the potential in all teams, it was absolutely stupid of us to keep this to ourselves. And so we packaged it up and we've launched it. So the URL you see there for those with amazing eyesight, uh, Atlassian.com slash team playbook. In October last year, we launched the team playbook for the entire public to use. Uh, this is completely tool agnostic. You do not have to be an Atlassian customer. You do not have to spend a single cent. It is all completely free of charge. On there, you will see the three health monitors with full descriptions of how they work, what a healthy team looks like, and how that actually should be used. For every single area on the health monitor, so if we take uh, shared understanding, if we just go back, if we take uh, shared understanding on the project team health monitor, what you will see is for every app problem or challenge area, there are plays that accompany that. So if your team is struggling with shared understanding, you could do an elevator pitch. You could do a project poster. You could do an experience canvas. For any of you who have practiced agile, design thinking, lean, any of those kind of disciplines, none of this is rocket science. It will look very familiar to you. All we've done is take those disciplines, some of which I feel are a little bit utopian, and we've turned them into practices. This is how we actually use them and actually do them on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. What we found by doing this is that we had a sensation that our teams were starting to smell and look a lot like factories. We were starting to be quite process driven. As we scaled, people were like, what's the, uh, what's the policy for this and what's the process for that? How do we know that that's happened? We were, we were just going back through old ideas again and again. The phrase, that's not the way it's done here, started to come out, which is a great sign of status quo kicking in. You'd hire new people, and all you would do is indoctrinate them into your bad habits and ways of working. So you'd go to, you'd go to market, you'd hire a really smart, courageous, inspirational person that arrives day one at their desk with inspirational ideas. You're like, <laughs> I like your idea. It's not the way it works here. So if you could just comply with the really bad ways we've learned of working, that would be wonderful. We want to take all your value and leave it in your last company. Um, and this fear culture, the hierarchy was building a fear culture whereby people started going, well, I, I just don't want to upset my boss, or I don't want to dissent, or I don't want to do the wrong thing. And so we were starting to become really, really conservative. And when you think about the technology refresh cycle and you think about the changes that your customers expect and you think about how your competitors are trying to take on you and your teams and your products, that's not going to work. You have to be generating new ideas. You have to be seeking feedback. You can't have command and control. You have to accept as a leader that it's highly likely the people around you, around being below and to the side and above, but everyone around you is likely way more intelligent than you are. One of the amazing things about the playbook is it's absolutely nothing to do with me. I was working with the team that originally came up with the idea, but the three health monitors have been documented by other people, and the 26 plays have all been created and documented by our teams. I haven't got a thought leader somewhere in a corner, you know, churning through research and, and creating utopian theory. 
This is all actually being used day to day by our teams and gets evolved every single day as their patterns change and the world around them changes. What that means is we've now become a lot more ideas driven, a lot more experimental. There's a lot more sharing, there's a lot more positive dissent. Positive dissent sounds different than just dissent. Just dissent, normally someone's got their arms folded and they're just having a tantrum, often a little bit of victim mentality. Positive dissent is, I'm not convinced that's the best way to do this. Have you thought about X or Y? Positive dissent comes with an idea. Non-positive dissent's just grumpy, right? And I'm, I'm grumpy every now and then. In this world, we also test assumptions, we use data, and in our world, we are not data-driven, we are data-informed. So yes, we use data, and we are massive fans of data and, and how that can inform you, but data should be used in combination with your three brains. A lot of people forget they've got three brains and think they've only got one, which is this one, which is the logic part of the brain, and they forget about the heart, which is a very important part of your brain, and they forget about their gut instinct, their intuition. We say to all of our teams around the world, when you're making decisions, use the data. Don't let the data make the decision for you. Otherwise, I might as well fire you. There's no need for you if the data makes all the decisions. I want you to use your accumulative experience, your wisdom, your knowledge, all the things that you've acquired over your, your life, your work, and your social life to make an informed decision. That doesn't mean it's going to be right. We experiment so much that we average about a 50% failure rate, and that's cool because there are lots of really small experiments. They're not bet the company type experiments. When you go into this world, what you realize is, is that over time, the product development process has started to look like a process, like a linear process, and it's not. The reality of what you're doing day in, day out is not a linear process where you ship and forget. If it is, you're doing it wrong. You're not getting the value from it. What we say in our world, and, and I'm sure it's consistent with your world, is it is a circular experience. The quicker I can ship something and demonstrate progress, the quicker I get feedback, the more feedback I get, the more I evolve and iterate. The more I evolve and iterate, the better the product becomes. The quicker I ship, the more feedback I get, and we go on the loop again and again and again. It's important that we know where we are in the loop, but it's actually more important to know that it is a loop and it's a continual feedback loop. So some actions for you. You don't just come here to listen to me tell stories. The first action is, the playbook is something that we publish not for ourselves, we use it internally. In fact, that URL, the team playbook URL, we have now actually retired our internal version, and the teams at Atlassian use the same version that's open to the public. Because of that, one of the things that we've recently added on there are a whole lot of templates and examples of how these have been used. What you'll see in the examples is actual real data, because we couldn't be bothered sensitizing the information in there. So we've shared real examples of how teams at Atlassian use this. For this to work in your environment, there's a few things you need to do. The first one is embrace the fact that being effective is more important than being just efficient. And the second one, which is a damn sight harder, is unlearning. You have to unlearn some of the things that worked for you last year or the year before that will not work for you this year or next year. You have to unlearn those patterns and be willing to try new ones. In doing that, you actually, as a leader, need to embrace failure. I cannot tell you how many leaders I talk to who talk about failure, and then when I say to them, can you give me an example of anything you felt? Well, I haven't. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm too smart to fail, but people around me often fail. And that's not embracing failure, uh, that's ridiculing failure, uh, and that's, that's kind of not cool, right? So you need to be able to unlearn. To do this, what I would recommend is take actually going into the playbook and having a play with it. it is, the word play is in there on purpose. It is not a very serious document. The way we've written the plays are actually like recipe cards. Step one, do this. Step two, do that. Step three, do this. It's almost idiot proof. I say almost because I don't want to offend anyone that reads it and thinks it's really hard. It's not that hard. But just follow the steps. Have a look at it. Try it. In my experience in doing this externally, the best place to start tends to be the health monitors. What I found is high-performing or highly intelligent teams often lack empathy and self-awareness. They are so focused on high performance, they're not aware of the gaps that they have that could make them better. So using the health monitor is a great exercise 
just to raise the voices. It's a great leveler. Everyone in the room is an equal. There is no hierarchy. There is no right or wrong answer. When we do the health monitors now, it's the, probably the lowest technology exercise we're doing at Lassie, and we do it with our thumbs. You put your hand behind your back. You read the area, and then you vote. Three, two, one, thumb up, thumb sideways, or thumb down. It's a great way of getting the introverts or the quieter people to give their opinion, and then they share their views. What we find in there is that often there's a, there's a celebrity, there's a loud person in the room who wants to dominate the conversation. They are the one that thinks they're always right. The challenge for them, if, if that's you and that resonates with you, the challenge there is just to actually shut up and listen. It's one of the hardest things to do as an extroverted leader, is just to listen to the people in your teams because you will get way more information by listening to them by hear, than, than you will from hearing your own voice. The next thing is to understand your environment. So we've used this with distributed teams. One of the things we've done with distributed teams is, again, listen to the people that are on the end of the phone or the video conference first. One of the mistakes we made when we first rolled this out is our teams that were actually working across borders would run it separately. And all they were doing was putting brick walls between them and their teammates. In reality, they were one team. Uh, one particular team that's uh, for the chat that asked about distributed teams, what we did with the team recently is we run a health monitor as the team formed, and they used that as a discussion point to agree what was their rhythm and cadence that would work for them so they could still be effective. One of the examples was most of the team in Sydney come in late on a Monday and stay a bit later on a Friday because they're working with a team from the US. And they're like, oh, that works, and this time frame works, and someone's in Amsterdam. It wasn't me going in saying, here's how you do this. They had an open discussion around, how do we collaborate? Let's agree that at the end of the day before you leave, you drop a note in the chat room with a link to the page that is the latest status of all the actions. OK, agreed. What that has meant is they can work around the clock, and they're not pausing, they're not slowing down, because they haven't got information because other people are in bed. It was also a great way of actually explaining that every single one of those team members had a valuable commitment, a valuable contribution to the team. A lot of the time, the remote person feels at arm's length and is very easy to forget. We then use regular health monitors to actually bring them into the conversation. It's the same for diversity and inclusion. It's the same for making sure that everyone has a voice, black, white, male, female, in the office, remote, whatever the demographic. The whole idea of this is it's a team exercise that brings everyone in together, and listening is more valuable than talking. What we've also found is workplace has to be congruent with your practices and your people. For example, I had a, a COO from one of the big uh, banks in Australia came into our office. Uh, his quote was, I've purchased every single effing piece of effing collaboration, effing software, and none of them work. They're all crap. Uh, so I showed him around our office, he saw some people sparring, uh, we were doing some stuff on a whiteboard, he saw a workshop, and he's like, yeah, he took some notes. And I said, do you mind me asking what, what you've written down? And he said, um, I think I need more whiteboards. I said, you, your bank makes billions a year, I'm, I'm sure you've had whiteboards before. So the next day I went to his office, and literally everyone is in these old school grey cubicles, you know, up to about six foot high, just sat there, and everyone looked petrified of doing anything other than working. In fact, the image I got, it looked like a, they'd organized the workplace like an Excel spreadsheet. Every cubicle was a cell. Every person had given, been given a formula. As long as you got your formula done, it didn't matter when you got done. You still had to wait till 6.30 because you didn't go home until the boss went home. And literally, they all looked like flamingos. They had their head down doing this, they had their bum in the air, and they just had their fingers crossed hoping that it wouldn't hurt. But there was no collaboration there. There was no engagement or vibe. There was no creativity or curiosity. There was compliance and adherence. They were running an Excel spreadsheet. So the workplace, your environment, is very important to how you get teams to collaborate and share and discuss and work together. One of the important things for me, um, this is a trend I think we'll see more of in the next sort of five or 10 years, is actually sort of mental wellness, uh, well-being, mindfulness. So as artificial intelligence and automation takes away the mundane tasks, if you think you do 40 hours of work a week, I wish I did, but imagine we all did 40 hours of work. Imagine 10 of those are doing mundane tasks right now. I use those 10 hours to recharge my brain. The problem is when automation or a robot takes those 10 hours of work, 
Will my employer pay me for those 10 hours and let me do fun things? Or will my employer give me 10 hours more gnarly, hard, complex problems to solve? I'm guessing the latter. In which case, how does my brain, how does my psychological safety respond to that? Are we as humans equipped to do 40 hours of highly complex work a week? Or actually, are we only mature enough and evolved enough to do 30 hours complex work and 10 hours of mundane tasks? And then the last one is to understand the levers. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going through epic change. You know, our playbook is evolving because the world around us is evolving. We're continually adding new plays. We're retiring plays that don't work for us anymore. We are likely to add a new health monitor in the next probably six weeks, which is for rapid response teams. Again, that wasn't something we planned to do, but we looked around, we saw incidents, teams being formed, response, learning, implementing that learning. Incident, response. So we are now building incident response team health monitors to share with our teams internally and then externally into what are the best ways of working as an incident response team. Uh, millennials are making more of the workplace now than they've ever made before. Uh, a recent stat I saw is that in the next few months, if not already, they will make up 50% of the workforce. The challenge with that is the baby boomers, the aging workforce that we all assume is going to retire, can't retire because the financial services industry completely screwed up their retirement fund and none of them have any money. So we've got this aging workforce that kind of either doesn't want to retire, is certainly living longer because healthcare has got better, uh, and they can't afford to retire. So what's going to happen with the aging workforce? How is the aging workforce going to combine and spar and collaborate and work seamlessly and effectively with the millennials? The millennials who, by the way, are petrified because stats say they're going to have 17 jobs in their career, half of which haven't been even invented yet. God knows how they're going to have the skills for them if they've finished university already. In theory, they've got all the skills they need, but it's not true. Uh, and there's half the jobs that even exist yet. So we're going to go through rapid change. The workforce, the nature of work, the addition of robotics and artificial intelligence. We, we have a decision to make. Um, I believe we've got way more information right now on, on how the world is changing around us than any generation before us. The challenge we have is, do we think we're a passenger or a driver? Previous generations have felt like a passenger. They've let things happen and then had a good old British complain and whinge about it afterwards. But it's all all right. I believe that we should be drivers. We are the ones, certainly if you're working in the software industry, that are at the pointy end of a lot of these changes. So we have to accept that we are a conscious driver in how this works. We have to accept that diversity and inclusion is important to us. That cognitive diversity is important to us. That sparring, collaborating, that, that the theory that great minds don't think alike is important to us and finding ways of making our teams more effective, because the more effective they are, the more effective we are, the more effective our organization is, and the more relevant we are, and the more likely we are to be around in a few years, and not a statistic about, remember, that company that used to do X. To do this, we need to understand those levers and, and fundamentally change our belief system that creativity is more valuable than consistency. And creativity in how you work, the practices you apply, and how you get the most out of yourself and your teams is critical. Uh, this chap is no longer with us, but you know, he's come out with some classic phrases in his time, mainly around culture, eating strategy for breakfast. But this is the one that resonates for me when I think about this topic. Um, there's a lot of people out there trying to predict the future. I don't know if they have crystal balls or not. Good on them if they have. Instead of predicting the future, fuck it, let's just build it. Like, we're, we're all in this room because we have the ability to do that. In the roles that we're in, we have a chance to make a really high impact uh, on the world that we live in uh, and the people that we love and care for live in. So let's take ownership of that future and create it, but do it consciously and go and create some awesome teams that deliver high impact in whatever field you're working in. Thank you very much. <laughs>